Hello, DEF CON Safe Mode with Networking. How are you all today? Hope you're having a good day so far. Uh, my name is Cooper Quinton, and thank you for coming to my talk, Detecting 4G Base Stations in Real Time. First, a little about me. I am a security, senior security researcher at the EFF Threat Lab. Um, I have a toddler, so you'll have to forgive the dad jokes and possible baby noises in the background. I'm also a former teenage phone freak. I may have built some boxes to do some nefarious things back in the day, which might explain why I got into the work that I do now. Uh, if you're not familiar with EFF, we are a member-supported nonprofit. Over half of our annual funding comes from small donations from our members. Um, individual donations, and uh, we defend civil liberties online. So we think that when you get online, your rights come with you, um, and that when you're using technology, you still have rights, such as freedom of speech and the right to privacy. And we've been doing this work for 30 years this year. We started in 1990. Um, so we've been, we have a, we have a lot of experience under our belt. We've been defending the internet and defending hackers for a long time. I work in the EFF Threat Lab, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But I want to first introduce my colleague Yamna. Uh, she can't be here with me on the DEF CON stage today, uh, but none of this research would have been possible without her hard work. Uh, this is as much her project as it is mine, and she is an incredibly smart, incredibly talented person. So if you see her in the virtual halls of DEF CON Safe Mode, please buy her a virtual beer. Uh, or follow her on Twitter. Her name is at RivalElf, and she is a giant, sentient, very excitable radish, so don't be scared when you meet her. This is an actual photo of her. A bit about Threat Lab. We look at technology that targets at-risk people. So by at-risk, I mean uh, people who are at risk of harm just for being who they are, having the beliefs that they do. And this includes activists, human rights defenders, journalists, domestic abuse victims, immigrants, sex workers, minority groups, political dissidents, and so on. Um, basically, anybody who is at risk. Uh, for who they are. And the technology that is affecting these people typically has some goals like gathering intelligence on them or spying on them, um, especially in uh, in cases where they have where the where the person doing the spying no longer has the authority to, if they've left the boundaries of their country where normally they could be spied on, or if they're being spied on by somebody who can't normally spy, like a spouse or a, or a um, or an opposing group. Um, locating them, capturing them, extorting them, harassing them. Basically, uh, in a nutshell, to stifle freedom of expression and human rights of people that you don't like. So this is the sort of technology that we research and try to, uh, try to get a handle on. And we do this work because even though uh, cybersecurity teams and antivirus companies are doing a good job of what they do, they mostly care about the type of malware that affect uh, their customers, which are usually enterprise customers. And this is things like ransomware, banking trojans, um, um, things that steal sensitive corporate data, things that affect bigger businesses. And we get to care about the types of technology that infringe on civil liberties and human rights of at-risk people. Uh, because these people don't necessarily have the budget to pay a security team, um, but we also, by virtue of working for a nonprofit, don't have to worry about meeting a bottom line at the end of the day. So we like to think of ourselves as the security team for people who need it most and yet can afford it the least. Our goals in this work are, of course, first and foremost, to protect people. We want to make sure that the people are in, our com in the communities that we work with are safe um, and able to express themselves and able to uh, exercise their human rights. We want to broaden the community's understanding of the sorts of threats they face, who the threat actors are, what their capabilities are, and what sorts of technologies they might be facing. Um, and we want them to better understand their defenses as well, how they can protect themselves, in what ways, and what sort of measures they might need to take. We want to expose bad actors, such as nation states or companies or cyber mercenaries that are going after people and that are building technology to spy on civilians and violate human rights. And we want to make better laws, because we're a legal nonprofit at the end of the day. We want to make better norms and better laws and better uh, norms in civil society so that these sorts of things don't keep happening again and again. 
Some of our previous projects include the Coalition Against Stalkerware, which is a project put together by my colleague and boss, Eva Galperin, uh, where she worked with a bunch of other uh, advocates in this space to get antivirus companies to finally mark stalkerware as malicious. Previously, they had been marketing as a potentially unwanted program and not notifying their users about it. And because of her due diligence and her tireless work, now antivirus companies are marking stalkerware uh, as as um, malicious. And stalkerware is a type of spyware that you would use to spy on a spouse or significant other. It's sold for you know a, a few tens of dollars, and you can easily install it on your uh, on a person's phone and spy on them. And we we don't think it's good that this exists. Um, Another project that we've worked on, that I worked on, is called Dark Caracal. This was a study of a threat actor that was spying on Lebanese civilians that we had also tied to a group that had been spying on a Moroccan, Moroccan independent journalist. Um, we did a lot of research and did a report about this a couple of years ago. Um, it turned out we were able to track down the person behind this attack. Um, to a building in downtown Beirut in Lebanon belonging to the general directorate of general security, which is uh, Lebanon's premier spy agency. And we think that this was a person working in that building that was also freelancing um, or that was contracting with Lebanon to do spyware work. So that's a that's a report. Those Both of those are on the EFF website. And you can read more about them there. Because we're not here today to talk about those. Uh, what I want to talk to you about today is cell site simulators, also known as stingrays or MC catchers. I want to talk about how they work, some previous efforts to detect them, um, and why I think that those efforts aren't so great, and a new method that we've come up with to detect them here at EFF, um, and also how to fix the problem of cell site simulators once and for all. First, a little bit of terminology. Um, this is acronym HELL, and I apologize in advance. It was a pain in the ass to learn, and I hope that it will be slightly less painful for you uh, for you here in this presentation if I, if I give you these up front. So the UE is the phone. It's just the phone. It stands for user equipment, but it's just the phone, the thing you're making the calls on. Uh, the MC is the International Mobile Subscriber ID. This is the ID that is burned into the SIM card and unique for each SIM card. The IMEI is the International Mobile Equipment ID, and this is the unique ID for the hardware that's burned into the hardware and can't be changed. The eNodeB, or the base station, this is what the UE, or user equipment, again, the phone, this is what the UE is actually communicating with. Um, this is the thing that's at the end of the antennas that you're talking to. Um, the ERFCN, or E-A-R-F-C-N, is, this is the frequency that the UE and the E node B are communicating on. Um, the sector is a specific antenna that is attached to the base station or E node B. An E node B can have multiple sectors, um, and, and each sector basically is an antenna pointing in a specific direction. Uh, the MIB, or Master Information Block, is broadcast by the eNodeB and tells uh, phones where to find the SIB, or System Information Block, which contains more details about the eNodeB, such as the cell ID, the MCC, MNC, and TAC, which are the mobile country code, the mobile network code, and the tracking area code, respectively. The mobile country code being an indicator of what country this base station belongs in, the mobile network code being an indicator of what network it belongs to, and the TAC being an indicator of the roughly the geographic area. And finally, the PLMN, which is just a concatenation of the country code and the network code, which stands for Public Land Mobile Network. So finally, um, I'm going to use the terms MC Catcher, Stingray, Hailstorm, Fake Base Station, and Cell Site Simulator all kind of interchangeably. Um, these don't mean exactly the same thing. A cell site simulator and a fake base station are fake cell towers. Uh, a Stingray and a Hailstorm are two brands of cell site simulator. An MC catcher is sort of a common term for one of the things that cell site simulators do, although not all MC catchers are cell sites that fully em emulate a cell site. Uh, some MC catchers can run passively and not actually transmit anything, thus not emulating a cell site. But for our purposes, we're going to use them interchangeably, and that's okay for the purposes of this talk. 
So here we have a diagram of the 4G network. Uh, this is a pretty high level diagram, but you can see here that the uh, user equipment, the phone, connects to the eNode B using the LTE protocol. Um, through the uplink, the eNode Bs can talk to each other through another protocol, and the eNode Bs exist in a network called the EUTRAN. Um, and then you have a network called the Enhanced Packet Core, um, which is behind the eNode Bs, and this contains the MME, or Mobility Management Engine, um, the Serving Gateway, which, and the PDN Gateway, which connect to the public data network, which connect to the back to the phone network, um, and the EPC is also responsible for authenticating the user, billing, etc. We're not going to focus on the EPC today. There are, there are issues there that we could talk about, um, but it's out of scope for this talk. We're instead going to focus specifically on the communication between the user equipment and the eNode B, and there's sort of the area inside of this red circle. Um, so we started this project because we already knew a lot about the Stingray. Um, some law enforcement agencies had had the Stingray. The Stingray had been around for a while, um, and it was pretty well understood how it worked. Kristen Padgett did a really great talk at DEF CON several years ago uh, where she demonstrated building her own homemade Stingray, and it's pretty well understood the vulnerabilities. But what we were noticing was that law enforcement was starting to upgrade their cell site simulator devices to newer devices such as the Hailstorm, which purported to be able to operate natively in 4G. And we started wondering, well, we have a pretty good idea of how the Stingray works, but we have no idea of how the Hailstorm and these newer devices are operating in 4G, how they might work. So let's dig into this and let's start by figuring out how they could possibly work. And the first thing we want to look at is what changed between 2G and 4G. And there are three significant changes that affect the way that a cell site simulator might work. The first and most important is that the eNode B and the UE in 4G mutually authenticate each other. In 2G, the user equipment or the phone had to authenticate itself to the eNode B or the base station, but the base station never had to prove that it was a real base station. And this was the source of a lot of fake base station attacks such as the ones that the Stingray used in 2G. And with 4G, this is no longer a problem. Uh, also, in 2G, you had terrible encryption. Uh, the base station would dictate to the user equipment what cipher to use, uh, and it could even dictate that the user equipment use a null cipher. Um, what's more, the ciphers that were used by 2G were actually quite weak and could be broken in real time or in near real time um, by anybody recording the packets between the base station and the phone um, without even having to transmit anything. This is no longer the case in 4G. Now the eNode B and the UE mutually, uh, mutually agree on what encryption to use and the ciphers are much, much better. Also in 2G, the phone would always just connect to the strongest tower that it could see. And 2G could even, in 2G, you could even dictate how strong your signal was, telling the phone to ignore the actual signal strength and just trust what you were saying the signal strength was. Um, neither of these are the case anymore in 4G. The phone no longer naively connects to the strongest tower. Instead, there are a set of cell selection criteria that it follows. So, great, we've solved all the problems, right? Well, clearly not, because there are still cell site simulators that are operating natively in 4G. So, me and Yamna set to work reading all of the academic literature that we could about, about vulnerabilities in 4G and what could possibly be making cell site sim next generation cell site simulators work. And after several months of reading, uh, over a year of reading, really, Yamna wrote a really amazing paper called Gotta Catch Em All, which summarizes all of our findings, everything that we learned, um, about what vulnerabilities next-gen CSSs might be taking advantage of. Um, and we, we really figured out that there's one specific area where 4G is extremely vulnerable. 
So 4G has a bit of a glass jaw. Even though the UE authenticates with the tower, or authenticates the tower now, there are still several messages that get sent, received, and trusted before that authentication ever happens, or without authentication ever happening in the first place. And this is the weak spot in which the vast majority of 4G attacks happen. I'm not going to get into those attacks here today because Yamna has already done a really excellent job of summarizing those in that paper, and I highly suggest that you go read it. It's an excellent paper. Um, but to give a high-level summary, the this is the handshake protocol between the user equipment, the phone, again, and the base station. And it starts with the user equipment looking on each ERFSIN or frequency for a frame synchronization signal from a base station. Once it finds synchronization signals, it is able to find the MIB, master information block, and decode that, which lets it find the SIB and decode that, which gives it enough information uh, about the, um, the, the mobile country code, the mobile network code, to decide whether it wants to connect and then send an RRC, radio resource control, RRC connection request. Um, it, start, it does that handshake, and then it begins the attach request. And here in step seven is where the authentication finally starts. All of the messages before that are never authenticated. And some of the messages that get sent in that area can contain things like the IMSI of the phone, allowing you to uniquely identify it. Um, it can contain even the GPS coordinates of the phone, allowing you to locate it. Um, and a bunch of other things, attacks that allow you to downgrade it to 2G, or allow you to kick it off the mobile network entirely. So this is where the heart of all of the vulnerabilities lie in 4G, and this is the part that we find really interesting. So. Now that we had a pretty good handle on how 4G cell site simulators are probably being used, we wanted to get an idea of how often they're being used. Um, and if we want to learn how often they're being used by US law enforcement, the best way to do this is to file FOIA requests. Um, ACLU filed a really excellent FOIA request, uh, which came back, which just got published this year in 2020. Um, about uh, ICE and DHS's use of cell site simulators. And in it, they discovered that ICE, or U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, used cell site simulators between 2017 and 2019 a total of 466 times, hundreds of times per year. Uh, DHS, on the other hand, used their cell site simulator 1,885 times between 2013 and 2017. We also found out that Customs and Border Patrol, or CBP, owns 33 cell site simulators, which is a ton, and we don't know how often they're being used, but we can assume that it's probably on par with ICE and DHS. Oakland, on the other hand, oh, the Oakland PD, lo Oakland's local uh, police department in California, um, they used their cell site simulator, which is a hailstorm, three times in 2017. In 2018, it was used four times, and in 2019, it was used only once. Uh, but on the other hand, Santa Barbara PD, the local police department for Santa Barbara, California, used their cell site simulator 231 times in 2017, roughly matching up with the numbers from ICE and DHS. So what makes Oakland so much different in this case? Well, we think that it's because Oakland has stronger privacy laws. Oakland has pretty strong regulations about when and where the cell site simulator can be used, how it can be used, and what sort of reporting, public reporting, needs to happen afterwards. And we think that that has really kept Oakland PD on a leash as far as their use of cell site simulators is concerned. So we encourage other communities to come up with similar rules and regulations about how these can be used. But of course, not everybody using a cell site simulator is going to follow rules and regulations, um, nor can they be FOIA. We have pretty good evidence that foreign spies are using cell site simulators. The Department of Homeland Security put out a report last year where they demonstrated that they found several cell site simulators around the White House and around Washington, D.C., um, which almost certainly belong to foreign spies trying to spy on the political class in Washington, D.C. 
Um, we also have reason to believe that cyber mercenaries such as NSO Group have access to cell site simulators. Uh, a report from Amnesty International um, that was put out this year in 2020 uh, detailed a campaign against a Moroccan journalist by to uh, to spy on a Moroccan journalist by NSO Group, where they also use cell site simulators to intercept his calls. Um, and finally, we think that just straight up criminals have access to these. There's rumors that uh, drug cartels have access to a cell site simulator, and it makes sense. Cell site simulators are pretty easy and pretty cheap to build at this point. Um, and if you don't want to build one, you can acquire them from companies in Israel, companies in Saudi Arabia. Um, they're really pretty ubiquitous and pretty easy to acquire. And of course, these people can't be FOIA. We can't ask them how often they're being used, so we have no idea how often these groups are using these. So that being the case, our next step is we start to think about, okay, how can we detect cell site simulators? And there are two schools of thought for how to detect cell site simulators. One is app-based, and this is applications like AIM-60 or Android MC Catcher Detector, Snoop Snitch, or Darshark. The strengths of these are that they're cheap. It's an app, you install it on your Android phone, um, and they're easy to use. You start the app, you let it run, it lets you know what uh, if it finds a, something that's suspicious. All you need is an Android phone, um, and it might need to be rooted, it might need to be a specific type of phone, but you don't really, as long as you have that phone already, you don't have to spend any further money. The weaknesses of these are that you're going to get very limited data. AIM-6D uh, only gives you, if on an unrooted phone at least, only gives you the MCC, MNC, and the and the uh, location and the location area code, and some information about the signal strength. Snoop Snitch and Darshark get more info because they're able to read baseband messages on the phones that they support, but it's still you're only getting the info about uh, cells that your phone is connected to, and you're getting a lot of information about weird things happening, but a lot of those end up being false positives because many of the things that could be indicators of cell site simulators are also just weird, these sorts of weird things that happen in the cell network quite often. And because of that, it's you get a lot of false positives and it's hard to tell what is actually a cell site simulator and what is maybe just the cell network being the cell network. The other school of thought is radio-based, and this is um, basically things where you have a software-defined radio or a cellular modem, and you're getting information about all of the towers around you, and you're putting that in a database and running some heuristics to determine what's suspicious. Um, projects that are examples of this are Seaglass from the University of Washington, uh, Sitch from Ash Wilson, and Overwatch, which is a commercial product. The strengths of these are that you can get better data. You can get data from all of the towers in an area, not just the ones that you're connecting to. Um, you can also get lower level information. You can get uh, as low level information as you want based on you know how what you can program with your radio, right? The weaknesses of these are that they're harder to set up. Um, they can be harder to use and interpret because you maybe have to run Linux and set up a server and uh, you have to put together some hardware and maybe even have to know a little bit of programming. Also, the weakness is that you have to buy that hardware and hardware can be expensive. Um, you might have to spend a couple hundred dollars to get running, whereas the app is free. So there are strengths and weaknesses to both of these. But armed with this knowledge, we started hearing rumors about cell site simulators being used at the Standing Rock protest, uh, or at the at the uh, Dakota Access Pipeline protest in uh, Standing Rock, North Dakota. And given that we had some ideas about how maybe one could detect cell site simulators, and we wanted to know if they were being used at protests, we decided to go down to Standing Rock and see what we could find. So I armed my phone with Snoop Snitch and aim d and I brought along a couple of RTL SDRs, which I figured I could do some spectrum analysis with, and made my way down to Standing Rock. And what I figured out was that 
I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and by the way, this dog is, I, I don't know, our Patronus is canceled now. I, if not, this dog is my Patronus. I very much identify with this dog. But we had no idea what we were doing. When we got there, what we realized was there were no 2G towers anywhere to be found. And whether they be legitimate or illegitimate. And all of our detection methods were focused on detecting 2G towers. If a 2G cell had shown up all of a sudden, that would have been a pretty strong indicator. But we weren't able to find any evidence of 2G cells while we were at Standing Rock. And the conclusion that we came to is that if cell site simulators were being used at Standing Rock, they must be next generation cell site simulators that were operating natively on 4G. Which leaves us with the question, how can we detect 4G based cell site simulators? And how can we improve on previous attempts to detect cell site simulators? Well, first off, um, I think that the radio-based method is solid. Sea uh, Glass had already put up some pretty interesting results, and the idea of getting information about all of the cells in an area, everything that's broadcasting, not just the ones that your phone's connecting to, um, and comparing that data over time, I think are really interesting. So let's add on top of that, looking specifically at 4G transmissions, um, having heuristics based on what we've learned from Yamda and my, uh, mine and Yamda's research, and let's verify the results. When we find a suspicious tower, let's go track it down and see what it actually is. Is it on top of a cell tower? Yeah, great, it's probably fine. Is it on top of a building? Yeah, that's fine, it's probably a small cell. Is that building an embassy? Well, that's a lot more suspicious. And finally, is it in an unmarked van or in a van surrounded by police officers? Well, that's very suspicious. So without further ado, I introduce to you Crocodile Hunter. Crocodile Hunter is an open source project uh, that we've been working on at EFF for the last couple of years and are releasing here at Virtual Black Hat and DEF CON this week. Uh, Hunter, Crocodile Hunter is a hardware and software based. Uh, it uses an SDR and the software. Um, the back end is based on SRS LTE, which is an open source LTE software stack that's able to emulate both the enhanced packet core, um, the, the eNodeB, and also the user equipment, which we use to uh, measure the cell network in the area. Uh, it's written in C++ and it, we, we wrote a program in the SRS LTE API to do to scan the cell network for us. The, pi, the front end, um, which it communicates with over a local socket, is written in Python 3. Uh, the front end is responsible for getting data from the socket from SRS LTE, adding it to the database, running heuristics, and displaying tower locations. Uh, and we also have an API so that if you want to gather data from multiple sensors or if you want to share data between multiple researchers, you can. Here's an example of what the user interface looks like. This is from a scan that me and my colleague Dave Moss did in downtown San Francisco during the Dreamforce conference last year. Um, each of these points on this map is, we think, the probable location of a cell in downtown San Francisco on that day. The orange points are cells that we didn't find to be suspicious, and the black skulls are cells that we did think were suspicious. And I should note here that certainly there's no way that each of these black skulls is a cell, is a cell site simulator. In fact, probably none of them are cell site simulators, but we think they're suspicious and require further checking. Um, and I'll go into more depth about that later. On the hardware side, uh, the hardware stack is a laptop or a Raspberry Pi running Ubuntu, uh, and you need a battery for the Pi if you want it to be mobile, uh, a USB GPS dongle, and an SDR with some LTE antennas. Uh, for the SDRs, we've tested it with a Blade RF and an Edis B200. Uh, it should support all models of Edis and Blade RF. Um, it 
also theoretically could support a Lime SDR, which is significantly cheaper. Uh, I think the Blade RF will run you about $500, whereas a Lime SDR will run you about $250. Uh, but we have not tested it with that. Uh, but that is on the roadmap because we would like for this hardware stack to be cheaper. Here's what the hardware looks like sitting on my kitchen counter. Um, as you can see, it's actually pretty compact and you can easily put it into a backpack or uh, load it into your car and go for a drive around your city. Um, and it's pretty, and you can do it pretty discreetly. Uh, so the general workflow is we start by scanning all of the frequencies that we know about and decoding them each MIB and SIB that we find. We record those into a database, we map the probable location of those cells, uh, we look for any anomalies in the readings, and then we locate suspicious cells and confirm the results. And I'll go into each one of those in more depth. So we start by scanning a list of ERFSINs, again, frequencies. We start by scanning a list of ERFSINs that we get from an open source database called Wiggle. Wiggle is an open source database of war driving readings of, of Wi-Fi networks and also of cell networks. So we get all of the ERFSINs for the given geographical region we are in, and then we scan each of those. And our theory behind this is that we think that a cell site simulator is going to have to operate on the same frequencies that real cells are so that phones will be more inclined to connect to them. So we scan each of these frequencies, and if we find a MIB, we decode the MIB and the SIB, and we send it to the front end over our socket. The front end stores the information in a database, and it stores in that database the uh, mobile country code, the network code, the tracking area code, the cell ID, physical ID, and the ER SIM, the latitude and longitude of where the reading was made, the timestamp, the signal strength, the enode B ID, the sector ID, and a few other IDs, and finally the raw data from the SIB1. Um, and then the next step is that we try to map out the antennas in real time. And we map them out using a process called trilateration, um, which is a process where we did distance estimates that we're able to get from a combination of the frequency of the transmission and the signal strength, we can estimate the distance and then with multiple readings figure out where the towers are. Um, and then we can compare this to a ground truth such as Wiggle or Open Cell ID or the FCC database to see if other people have seen a cell with those identifiers in that area historically. Um, a quick explanation of trilateration versus triangulation. So trilateration is where you have a measurement of the distance away from a transmitter that you are but not what direction the transmitter is in. So you draw a circle around you, the point where you're at, and somewhere on the edge of that circle uh, is where the transmitter is going to be. Once you've made three measurements, you can draw three circles, and the place where those three circles intersect is the place where the transmitter is going to be located. Triangulation, on the other hand, is where you have a bearing, that is to say a direction of the signal, but you don't know how far away the signal is. With triangulation, you get two readings with a, with a, with a bearing, with a direction, and then you can make a triangle between the t with one line between the two readings and the other two sides being the direction of the readings. And where those two directions intersect is where the location of the tower will be. Um, so triangulation is good if you have direction, direction but not distance, and trilateration is good if you have distance but not direction. For trilateration, you only need one omnidirectional antenna, but for triangulation, you either need three omnidirectional antennas with all of, the, of their clocks synced so that you can actually measure the angle that the signal is coming from, or you need a directional antenna that's constantly spinning so that you can so that you can figure out where which which direction it points has the strongest signal and thus figure out the bearing. Um, given that we figured most people running this would only have one omnidirectional antenna and not a spinning antenna or three clock synced antennas and thus three clock synced radios, um, we figured that trilateration was our best bet. So finally, we look for anomalies. And what are we looking for in terms of anomalies? We're, well, looking for things like cells that move over time, um, cells where the signal strength changes, cells that aren't where they should be, in other words, cells that are here and also across the city, 
um, cells that change parameters. Suddenly this enode BID is broadcasting a different country code or a different network code or a different um, or suddenly it's broadcasting a different bandwidth or, or, or something like that. Um, we're also looking for cells that are missing some, some of the more obscure parameters in the SIB uh, or higher SIBs. Uh, and we're looking for new cells that are showing up. And again, it's important to mention here that just because we find an anomaly doesn't mean we've found a cell site simulator. We actually need to go verify it. If you know anything about 4G attacks and know how they work, you might be thinking at this point, but there's a lot of heuristics that you could have um, if you could actually connect to the tower. And that is true. Uh, there are a lot of really cool heuristics that we could get. If we could connect to a cell, we could see if we got a reject message, or we could see if it accepted us. Either one of those might be interesting. Um, we could see if it was missing some of the higher level or more esoteric parts of the LTE stack. Um, or we could, we could, there's all sorts of things we could measure. We could see how many paging messages sending out or how many other UEs are connected to the cell. But all of those would require connecting to the cell, and connecting to the cell requires transmitting. We thought it'd be a great idea until the EFF lawyers pointed out that that's illegal. Because we're using a software-defined radio, it's not actually licensed to communicate on the cell, or to transmit on the cellular bandwidths, whereas your cellular modem in your phone is licensed to transmit on those bandwidths. So we can't transmit on those bandwidths without violate on those bands on those frequencies without violating the law. Um, and we don't want to go to jail. So we decided not to transmit. But despite that, we still got some results. So what we found so far, our first test was at the Dreamforce conference, which I mentioned previously with my colleague Dave Moss. Me and Dave spent all day running around uh, downtown San Francisco. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Dreamforce, lucky you. Uh, Dreamforce takes over all of downtown San Francisco, and there's sales people running around everywhere. Um, we wandered around the main park where Dreamforce was happening, and we noticed this little cluster of suspicious cells here on the park near the where the um, event was taking place. So we started walking down 3rd Street and, and getting to the point where we thought the suspicious cells were, and we were thinking, hey, yeah, I think it, it's probably right about here. When we looked up and saw this giant black truck with a satellite dish on top of it. The satellite dish was pointing at a building about a block away that had a couple of cell antennas on top of it that we had noted previously. Um, after looking at the truck, looking up the company that was listed on the side of the truck, and talking to the guys in the truck, we determined that this is in fact a cell on wheels and not a cell side simulator. A cell on wheels is a portable cell, a uh, portable cell tower that uh, people bring out, companies bring out, to expand the cellular capacity in a given area, usually for large events. In fact, there was even one at Staten Rock. Um, we don't think that this was a cell site simulator. And in fact, cells on wheels are pretty common. Um, but they have some interesting similarities to cell site simulators. Um, in, 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 uh, namely, in that they are a portable cell that shows up that isn't usually there, is suddenly there, and then leaves. Um, and that they are, and that they are acting like legitimate cells. The main differences are that they're not actually um, trying to exploit any of the characteristics of the 4G network, and the people operating them are probably not using them to spy on them. Um, but we still think that this is a successful test. We were able to use our heuristics to find a new cell that had just showed up, and we were able to use our map to actually track that down and see what it was. If we had just been using an app, Maybe that app would have called this out, maybe it wouldn't have. And even if it had called it out, we wouldn't have known what to go look for or what it might have been. So we considered this a success. Earlier this year, we did a second test in, um, at Schmookon in Washington, D.C. Uh, so I loaded up uh, Crocodile Hunter with on, on a uh, Raspberry Pi running around uh, Schmookon with it in my backpack for the entire time. And what we discovered at Shmukon was two really interesting sets of two different enode Bs that would occasionally 
broadcast instead of the country code and network code of 310410, which maps to USA and AT&T, would broadcast a completely different country code and a completely different network code. Looking into it further, um, the, the first one was broadcasting on the same ERSIN as what we think is the legitimate tower, but would broadcast a different MCC and an MNC of 350 and 490. Uh, 350 is the country code for Bermuda, and the MNC 490 is not used by any network in Bermuda. In the US, it's used by Sprint and T-Mobile, but again, this is an AT&T network. It was also broadcasting the same physical ID, um, but a different sector ID and a different tracking area code. So we find this really interesting. Um, in another instance, there was a there was another enode B broadcasting on the same ERSIN as what we think is a legitimate enode B, this time broadcasting a country code of 308 for St. Pierre and Miquelon, which if you need a point of reference, these are a couple of small islands off the coast of Nova Scotia. I was also not aware of them until I looked them up for this talk. Um, and the country and the network code 451 is not used by any network for anything ever, anywhere in the world. This network was also broadcasting the same physical ID, um, and in this case was broadcasting the same sector ID as the legitimate tower and the same tracking area code as the legitimate tower. So these were really interesting. Unfortunately, I, as I said, was running around with the crocodile hunter in my backpack and didn't notice these results until after the fact, so I didn't get a chance to go track them down. Uh, so hopefully in the future we'll find something like this and actually get to go physically locate it. We do have ongoing tests, though. Uh, our partners in Latin America with the Fake Antenna Detection Project um, have previously run around Mexico City and other places with um, sea glass and have gotten some really interesting results there and are planning next to run around there with Crocodile Hunter and see what they can find. And I'm really excited for what they will find. Uh, we also have uh, partners running Crocodile Hunter in Washington, D.C. and in New York City, and we hope, now that the project is open source, that you'll want to run this in your hometown as well. In the future, we hope to get better heuristics for Crocodile Hunter. Um, some of the heuristics I have right now aren't great. Um, and and uh, I think that there are other ones that we that we could do. We have a lot of ideas. Uh, we also we also can improve these once we get a better sense of how uh, MC catchers and cell site simulators are operating in the wild. Um, speaking of heuristics, once we get a lot of readings, we think that we can start to do some machine learning to build a classifier for what towers are behaving normally and giving normal characteristics and what towers are suspicious, maybe in ways that, that a human wouldn't notice. Um, I also want to get better location finding. Right now my location finding can sometimes be about 50 meters off, um, and that's that's not great. It's still pretty close and I'm, I'm okay with it. I think it's good enough, um, but I would like to get it much better, and that means we need better, um, we need better uh, uh, distance estimates which, which is beyond my math and physics knowledge, unfortunately. So, um, and the other thing we need is we want to port it to cheaper hardware. Like I said, the, um, the Blade RF will run you about 500 bucks. We think that it can work on the Lime SDR, which is cheaper at 250. I would love, I mean, my, my dream is that it would work on the RTL SDR, um, which would cost like $20, but I'm not convinced that the RTL SDR and a Raspberry Pi are actually powerful enough uh, or have the bandwidth to do what we need them to do. So that's, that's still up in the air. And finally, what's with the name? Well, uh, you may remember that one of the brand names for a cell site simulator is the Stingray. You may also remember that the stingray is the animal that finally killed Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter. So we named it Crocodile Hunter to press F for Steve. Finally, what can we do to stop cell site simulators? Well, we can start by having a toggle on iOS and Android to turn off 2G support. One of the main attacks for native 4G cell site simulators 
is to use that pre-authentication area to downgrade your connection to 2G. And once your phone is downgraded to a 2G connection, they can do things like in inspect content or do passive attacks to decrypt the messages between you and the cell tower, um, or they can emulate a 2G, uh, 2G base station. So your phone still supports 2G, and the reason for that uh, there's a good reason for that. It's because many people in the world still use 2G cells as their primary form of communication, and lots of 2G networks are still up. So, so iOS and Android can't just disable 2G by default. But what they could do is build in a toggle for users who are concerned about this to be able to turn off their 2G radios if they wish. Um, and we've written a blog post that uh, encourages them to do so. The main thing we need to fix, though, is these pre-authentication messages. Uh, all of the messages that happen after your phone connects to the tower, but before the authentication uh, starts. And, and that's a problem not in 4G, but in, not just in 4G, but in 5G as well. There is a pretty interesting proposal um, for, uh, for, for covering the all of the messages, or authenticating all of the messages between the tower and the user equipment with TLS. Um, there's a pretty good paper about this, uh, and it'll be linked here in, in the um, in the notes for this presentation. Um, that that proposes a way, and it's still in its infancy, uh, and it's going to take some more work. But we really think that long term, that's the solution. Um, but that's going to be have to be implemented by a standards body such as the 3GPP. Um, and the 3GPP is the standards body that makes all of the standards for cell networks. It's also going to have to be implemented by carriers, manufacturers, and OEMs. And we need more incentives for the standards or the carriers and the OEMs to care about user privacy. Right now, it often feels as though user privacy is an afterthought, and connectivity is really the most important, the primary goal of these of these organizations. And and we need to change that. The 3GPP costs several tens of thousands of dollars to get a seat on. And as such, there are no representations from civil society, from privacy organizations, or from nonprofits, and that needs to change. None of these solutions are going to be foolproof, of course, um, and our detection, and, and Crocodile Hunter isn't foolproof, but we're not even doing the bare minimum yet. And I think that we should be doing at least that. So, what do I want you to take away from this? Well, we have a pretty good understanding of the vulnerabilities in 4G, which commercial cell site simulators might exploit. And if you want to read more about those, I really highly suggest you read Yama's paper, Gotta Catch Them All. None of the previous MC Catcher detector apps really do the job anymore. Steaglass um, could certainly still detect uh, older MC Catchers, but none of them are able to detect newer MC Catchers. Um, but we've come up with a method similar to established methods, but targeting 4G natively. And we think that the worst problems of CSS abuse can be solved with a little bit of elbow grease and a lot of politics. Finally, thanks to the following people. Yamna, of course, uh, I couldn't have done this project without her, and she did so much amazing work. Thanks so much to Yamna. And please buy her a, uh, buy her a virtual beer or just challenge her to a game of Dance Dance Revolution if you see her. Uh, of course, thanks to the Holy FF crew and especially Threat Lab, um, who have been a huge support through all of this. Huge thanks to Andy and Bob at Wiggle for a lot of programming help and a lot of uh, for giving me unfettered access to their API. Uh, thanks to Roger Piqueros Hover, who is one of the smartest people uh, in the world about cell networks. He really knows his stuff, and he gave a lot of advice and a lot of encouragement. Uh, thanks to my test crew, Nima Fatemi with Candu, and Surya Matu and Simon from the Markup. Uh, Simon Fondry Teetler, thank you. Um, Carlos uh, with the Fade Project and everybody else involved in the Fade Project. Thanks for uh, running running Crocodile Hunter in South America. Uh, Carl Kosher and Peter Ney and others at the University of Washington uh, who authored Seaglots, as well as giving me tons of advice, um, tons of tons of support coming out to Standing Rock with me. Really fantastic people. Um, and of course, thanks to Ash Wilson, the author of Sigin, Eric Escobar, Defcon Justice Beaver, who also gave me a lot of inspiration and advice. And last but not least, thanks to Kristen Padgett for doing all the original research on cell site simulators and really paving the way for hackers to start looking at these. And also, thanks for the Nokia phones, Kristen. And finally, thank you for coming to the talk. Again, uh, my name is Cooper Quinton. I am a senior security researcher at the EFF Threat Lab. You can email me at cooperq at eff.org or you can find me on Twitter at CooperQ, and you can find the 
Um, you can find the code at github.com slash EFF already slash crocodile hunter. And last but not least, uh, there are some references at the end of this talk, which I'll leave you with. Thanks, and have a great rest of your con. Bye-bye.